Afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Alistair Roffel. I work at Queen's, like uh, Professor Montgomery. Uh, I'm a geologist by training, and uh, I work about 80% of my time on forensic geology, or the application of earth science techniques to criminal investigations. The rest of the time, I work on regular geological matters, but also have an interest in things like fracking, uh, which I'm sure would be another topic for conversation here. Um, uh, I'd like to thank a number of people, most especially those from DAERA, uh, formerly um, the Department of uh, the uh, um, Environmental Agency, most especially Una Stringer, who's currently there and has been a very good colleague of ours. Why is this a problem um, around the world, but especially here in Northern Ireland? Well, as you can see, uh, it's a huge financial issue in terms of the loss of uh, um, landfill tax. Um, but also the recovery and remediation of landfill sites, whether they be legal, illegal, or whatever, as well as, which uh, interfingers nicely with Ian's talk, the damage to the environment, both in terms of regulated, but most especially unregulated um, landfill sites down at the bottom here. Worldwide problem. And in many countries, of course, it's not even buried, it's just left as rubbish tips, Nigeria being the classic example. Okay, so how can we uh, assist, how can a scientist, most especially geologists like myself, assist in this? Well, we can, we can do three things, which are all classic parts of forensic geology or geoforensics, from the macro to the micro scale. And that's what I'm going to take you through today, is from the big down to the small. At the, uh, the, the large scale is what we call search, and this is identifying the target. So in regular forensic geology, this would quite often be um, buried weapons hides, uh, homicide victim graves, uh, mass graves, which uh, have the same uh, buried properties as illegal or even legal landfill waste as far as I'm concerned. At the medium scale, there's assessing how much and what is in the ground, and that usually involves digging. If you really want to know what's down there, you have to dig it up. But uh, at the scale of the actual site itself, we can use geophysics, and I'll demonstrate to you some geophysical methods to assess the volume in the ground, which is part of the prosecution that will be bought, is the amount that's there, and also its makeup, uh, the toxicity, in other words. And then at the smallest scale, which is actually the most traditional part of forensic geology, which is about trace evidence, which hasn't been used quite so much in uh, the detection and monitoring of landfill, uh, but it has been used to some extent, and I'll show you one case study example where we used not really trace evidence, which is more like mud on people's shoes on the underside of vehicles, but it's still a sample as opposed to uh, remotely sensed imagery. Okay, so the three reasons that geology can help mirror the three scales we work at, the macro down to the micro. Okay, thanks to Una, just to press home the point that these are not very nice places. And if ever, any of you have ever been uh, to the tip, which I'm sure you have, you can smell that it's not a very pleasant place. And that's a regulated uh, recycling facility. So just think about one that's unregulated and what it's got in it. So that just presses home the point that, as, to, as to the severity uh, of putting waste in the ground. It's nasty. Okay, before we had more clever remote sensing devices, we worked at the search scale on very traditional grounds. Uh, this was uh, looking at uh, what the geology was, most especially its diggability. And if it's not diggable, if you can't dig a hole in it, which would be the most common scenario for finding a homicide grave, something that's already been dug. So say a quarry, a pre-existing hole in the ground. So quarries are on databases, but also solid and uh, drift, which is the soft geology, are also on databases. So. Uh, what the land is being used for currently, what it's been used for in the past, what the geology is, its diggability, whether there's quarries there, mineral extraction locations or former mineral location extraction places, where the known landfills are, some of which uh, in the past have been not well regulated and thus are causing an environmental problem at the present day. So just outside the, the dump outside of Enniskillen, just this side of Enniskillen is a good example. Um, as well as the Hightown Road in West Belfast. Uh, whether people can get the waste there, so access roads, whether other people can see them, 
of visibility. And for this, we use uh, geographic information systems to predict things called view sheds or view shed analysis. Um, most commonly, the criminal activity goes, in covert, uh, carry, get, goes about in covert locations. Again, just like uh, criminalistics and the burial of a homicide grave would be in a, a covert location. Some of that can't be seen. But inevitably, people are seen, and thus intelligence is also uh, traditionally been a large part of finding out where these waste dumps are, uh, with which we create a predictive model. And I'm going to show you uh, how we develop that model now uh, with some more advanced techniques than this. This is not to denigrate the traditional method. We do do this. There is no simple spy in the sky which finds these things. Okay, we still must do th what th this is called a desktop study. And every site investigation, be it for a homicide grave or a, uh, a waste dump, must go through this process. It's not easy. Okay, uh, some of the more sophisticated techniques we have which add to that uh, desktop study would be in the area of rem remote sensing, which is what Ian uh, so nicely uh, um, uh, introduced for me. Waste dumps have a number of signals associated with them, a lot of which I'm going to show to you in a moment, one, one of the ways we're now uh, monitoring and detecting them. But one of the early methods we used was that uh, waste dumps are warm, they degrade, especially if they've got organic matter in them, which they quite often have. Because they've come from household waste, then there'll be black bin bags with old banana skins and uh, God knows what else in there, which are going to rot. Okay, and they warm up. So just as you'll see steam rising from a manure heap on uh, a cool uh, winter or springs morning, that's exactly the same process. The, the degradation of the waste is generating heat. So if we fly over that spot with a thermal imager, be that in a plane, or from a, an unmanned aerial vehicle, nowadays called a drone, uh, such as we have down in geography, archaeology, paleoecology in my building, uh, with a thermal imager on them, uh, we can detect where there's hot spots in the ground. These are not necessarily waste dumps. These are just areas that are warm. But if the rest of this intelligence goes with somewhere that's warm, then we've built up our profile of that area of land that possibly there is waste in the ground at that location. So this is one of the early remote sensing methods we used to find out whether there was waste in the ground. We developed this further, and this is why I introduced the uh, concept of forensic geology at the beginning here. And I imagine when you came in here today, you didn't expect to see a picture of a homicide grave. But we have used the model uh, from people searching for uh, burials in the ground uh, to advance our method of detecting uh, all manner of waste in the ground. And this is called the conceptual geological model. And this is the idea that be it waste, be it a human body, be it bags of fertilizer, if there's water added or there's water in them to begin with, like the human body, 80% water, uh, that, that liquid will, will move out in the ground as a leachate plume. So a human body does it and a, a waste site does it. This has been used very successfully, both in individual graves so one of the famous Moore's murders victims was found using a conceptual geological model, not, of the not finding the grave itself, but finding the plume of degradation products. I know this is gory, I apologize. But most especially mass graves uh, in former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and we're now currently working in uh, Chile using this exact model to find mass graves. So this has been done before with pollution sites but not in the way we're doing it. It's the concept of a plume. And the idea is, is that the, the target is small, but the plume of material it generates is big. So you've got a bigger footprint to try and detect using remote sensing. This is the concept. Okay, in this case, this, is, uh, this was done a lot in the United States, but here as well, most especially with old petrol stations. The storage is beneath the ground. They're not commonly inspected because they're pretty hazardous places to get into. They're old, they rust, they leak, uh, and benzene, all the rest of it, flows into the groundwater. But this was done using boreholes, sinking boreholes into the ground at spacing to detect where the plume is, which you still do, uh, drill boreholes. But with the TELUS survey and the TELUS border survey, uh, back starting in the uh, 2003, 2004, and then TELUS border just finishing, uh, which is an unprecedented amount of data generated by uh, remote sensing imagery um, 
from an aircraft, but also a ground sampling for environmental but also economic purposes. So this, the TELUS border survey had a huge impact on the Northern Ireland economy, with one of the gold mines being generated because of it, a new nickel mine on the Antrim coast, a new petroleum geology licensing. Uh, so say what you like about it as from an environmental point of view, as an economic point of view, a huge success. TELUS border was far more environmentally focused um, because in the TELUS survey, we noticed that from the, measuring the conductivity of the ground from the aeroplane, and this is generating an electrical signal, goes into the ground from the air, but we can do it from the ground as, uh, on the ground as well. If the ground is conductive, which waste commonly is, uh, we, get a, we get a signal. So basalt, the very famous rock type of the giant's causeway, is conductive. So you can see that even under Loch Ney, we have highly conductive ground. But what came out of the TELUS survey was the fact that we have quite a few of the known uh, and old landfills as conductive sites. And this is not the site itself, this is the plume. This is the plume of leachate, which is also conductive, flowing into the ground. And the question then raised was, what's happening in these locations? And can this be used in conjunction with those other methods I mentioned, the more traditional methods, the thermal imagery to detect landfill sites, legal and illegal, and what's happening in them? And the answer is yes, because we carried out various experiments and did various geophysical things I won't bore you with to show that, for instance, Ochnagun, a place I know very well near, near Mayo Bridge, which is a regulated landfill site, but is generating a plume of leachate which comes out on the, uh, on the resistivity profiles. In other words, the conductivity of the ground. Resistivity is the inverse of conductivity. So uh, the last point at the macro scale is where we actually have one of these sites and we want to know what's going on in it. And this is still remote sensing. This is laser interferometry where we fire a laser across the site uh, and we look at the spectral pattern uh, at a detector on the other side. This is very commonly used at, uh, at airports. So as you're taxiing around the airport in the, when you're going on your summer holidays or whatever, you'll see these little devices, and you probably wonder what they are. They're detecting air, aircraft emissions, which are a legal obligation that has to be done. So to try and find the target in an area that's maybe been detected at a big scale, we can do this without actually being on the ground. Uh, with a laser either on a truck with a mirror uh, or another detector on the other side. And this is detecting not the leachate in the ground, this is detecting the methane coming up out of the ground, which demonstrates to me the two problems that we have with landfill sites, and that's the water and the air, most especially. There's lots of others, of course, the noise, dust, etc., etc. But the things that are affected are the groundwater and the air. Uh, but that gives us the possibility to find them as well. So what's bad, it's not necessarily good, but it gives me, the geologist, an opportunity. Let's home into the middle area then, which is where I got involved in all of this. Uh, two gentlemen from the NIA, as it was then, before it became Dani, uh, Chris Hunter and Peter Parsons walked into my office and said they had a bit of a problem with calculating the volumes of waste in areas that they knew had been buried. The problem was they would dig five or ten holes, measure the depth, and extrapolate over the whole area. And then when they went to court, the defense would say, oh, yes, Your Honor, but my client buried a few pockets of waste, and that just happens to be where the environment agency dug their holes. The rest is really, really thin. The point is the seed of doubt was sown in the jury's mind. So they'd heard about geophysics, and they came to me to ask whether there was a way of assessing better not only the volume, but whether I could tell them what was in the ground. And the volume, yes. The content, maybe. And this is it. It looks kind of crazy, doesn't it? This is ground penetrating radar, which is one of the more famous geophysical methods. It's usually much smaller for things like homicide, the detection of homicide graves. This is a low frequency, deep penetration device called a rough terrain antenna. The students will call it the snake, which I think is a far better word. Uh, and it generates an electromagnetic wave, goes into the ground, and if there's something of different makeup down there, sends a reflection back. It shouldn't work in illegal or even legal waste dumps because of the conductivity of the ground, but it does, 
And that's one of our research questions as to why. We don't use it on its own. We use it in conjunction with another device I'll show you in a moment, which is the same as the TELUS plane, measures the conductivity. So whether you're carrying out a search for a homicide grave like here in North Belfast a couple of months ago, we always operate on the same scheme. We set up grids and we home in on targets and then we survey at higher frequency and higher resolution around the target until we get right in on it and have assessed its size, depth, etc. So the same for uh, inside a crime scene tent as out uh, here. I think I'm in Dumfries, Galloway looking for an area where animals were disposed of following the foot and mouth crisis. So it's the same process in each, and it produces these highly complicated and completely mystifying zebra patterns, which is why people employ me uh, to assess what these are. And this indeed is a mound where animal carcasses were piled up and burnt by the farmer, and uh, then a load of silt from a nearby river was, was put all over the field to conceal what he'd been doing. Um, Kind of strange because only 30 miles away in Carlisle was a, uh, a bona fide animal uh, destruction site. Uh, so we're not sure why this farmer did this in this particular case. So that's what we produce. And in this case, again, it's, they're difficult to interpret. Uh, this is out in Fermanagh, uh, a joint PSNI environment agency operation uh, to detect waste in ground. Uh, I detected a trench, and then we ran the same device as I showed you from the airplane, but here it's on the ground. Uh, resistivity, stroke conductivity, same thing, where we place probes in the ground, uh, fire in an electrical signal, and if we get a return, we know it's conductive. If we don't, we know it's resistive. We put the two together, so it's a multi-proxy or bi-proxy uh, approach, uh, because this device can tell us better what's there as opposed to this device, which will tell us the geometry. And remember what I said about landfill tax and about prosecutions. We need to know the volume, and we need to know the nature of what's buried there. These then also provide targets for the Environment Agency to come and dig and ground truth what's in the ground at these spots, as well as control sites elsewhere. Again, with the courts in mind, this is all being done with the aim of bringing a prosecution. Same difference. OK, homing in now. Uh, looked at the big scale, how we find these things, or try and find them, because as I mentioned, there's no magic in this. Uh, we have to know where to look in the first place before we deploy all that stuff. What we do when we're on the ground, digging, geophysics, and the most usual thing done in forensic geology, uh, less done in, in um, assessing waste sites, the microscale, which is looking at the geological evidence. This is a very well-known and famous trout, natural trout fishing location in, uh, in the uplands of County Tyrone, internationally renowned um, for the freshwater trout that were caught there, very well regulated, very well licensed, and as I say, very famous for its trout population, which vanished. Uh, it went from a, an estimated 10,000 trout to one uh, at the same time that this wind farm was put there. And we all think wind farms, great. Yeah, fantastic source of alternative energy, green energy. The contention was that the excavation for the foundations of the wind farms had simply been dumped on the foreshore and down into the lock. It was largely mud and peat. This had washed through the lock and, of course, trout spawn on gravelly or sandy-based uh, water bodies and this precluded the spawning of the trout. The, uh, the electricity generator denied this. The environment agency said, well, look, it all looks the same. Well, that's not good enough for the courts. Uh, there's no such thing as proof in the legal game, as I've learned to my detriment, uh, but there is the burden of evidence. Um, so we took transects from each of the wind farms down into the lock, uh, and we, what we do initially is very simple. We have a look. Um, at the texture, the color, the grain size. Then we cut thin sections and look at the microscopic makeup of the material. And we run a device called an X-ray diffraction device, which I won't go into the, the boring details of. There's a gentleman in the audience, Stephen McCabe, who knows all about XRD and can answer all your questions. But it's a kind of a mineral fingerprint. 
each of these peaks from the X-ray beam uh, is not a, definitely a single mineral, but it's more than likely to be uh, a mineral with a similar crystal structure. So this, for instance, is quartz. So we, again, it's a multi-proxy approach from the basic to the sort of advanced to the very advanced to say whether the material on the slopes and in the lock has any similarities to the excavated material or not. And again, there's no such thing as identical, but let's use that word to say that in my estimation, looking at that site, the material excavated was the same as the material in the lock. So this is not the slide, I, this was the slide I was going to put at the beginning, and I thought that'll completely freak everybody out. We'll put it at the end, which is all the stuff we do in forensic geology from the large scale satellites, drones, air, air, aircraft, down to going onto the ground using geophysics, mapping the target out, trying to say what the target is. It may even be in water. And my specialization is the search actually of water. And then the actual sample on the ground, be it water again, or be it uh, sediment, such as in, in the case of the upland lock, uh, to identify where it is, what, what is happening in the ground, what its hazards are, and what material we can bring to assist the law enforcement agencies with a prosecution. I don't do this alone. There are worldwide uh, bodies, mostly looking at um, serious crime, terrorism, trace evidence in serious assaults, rape cases, anti-terrorist operations, homicide graves, but an awful lot of which is the environmental sector in North America, especially in Brazil, uh, have a huge environmental aspect. Uh, the Italians are very strong on all of this. Um, so as well as my acknowledgements for the, 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 the local law enforcement agency, as well as uh, SEPA in Scotland, who I also work for, I must also acknowledge this gentleman here, Lawrence Donnelly, who is the head of this international organization, the Initiative on Forensic Geology. And as you can see, we are a worldwide organization. And it's, uh, if it wasn't for these people, I couldn't do what I do in terms of the macro scale search down to the micro scale of trace evidence analysis. Thank you very much. <laughs>